Today, I'm getting a refresher on the War of 1812. Like eagles and flags. No and way. There were several reasons why. Yeah, I imagine that did not go down well here. You American politicians. Boy, have times changed. Hello, everybody. Roger says, hey. Wait, why are you wearing the Napoleon hat? We're not doing Napoleon. We're doing the War of 1812, which takes place over here in America. Okay, I think you're getting a little carried away. <sighs> okay, fine, you can keep the hat, just... Well, I guess what we're learning about today, the War of 1812, it does tie back to what's going on in Europe, or so I've been told by a lot of you. Now, please don't take my lack of knowledge on the War of 1812 as a referendum on the American school system. The reason I don't know a whole lot about it is because I don't remember what I was taught in school about it, so it's as simple as that. We are taught about the War of 1812. What I do know about it is that it's kind of considered our second war of independence. The British burned down the White House. We apparently invaded Canada and was unsuccessful with that. And I believe that Andrew Jackson won the Battle of New Orleans and that kind of put him on the map and kind of the road to the presidency in the 1820s, I believe it was, when he was elected. Okay, so I just looked it up. It looks like he was elected in like 1828 and was president from 1829 to 1837. Anyway, I know he's a bit of a controversial figure in American history, so I don't want to really get into that right now. That's for another time, another video. From what I gather, Americans like to boast that they won the war. The British like to say that they won the war, but I think the truth is probably in a gray area in between. I did have someone comment in one of my other videos that when it comes to the War of 1812, the British and the Americans kind of got what they wanted out of it, and when it was done, we kind of just moved on. But regardless, this war took place over 200 years ago, so it is water under the bridge. And of course, the US and the UK are staunch allies now, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is just history, and I'm just kind of trying to look at it more objectively and just learn about what happened. And because I'm going through the Napoleonic Wars right now over in Europe, I want to know how this connects to all of that. Maybe how the two influenced each other, if they did at all. But I think it could be a really interesting comparison to see how things were over here in the kind of new world at this time versus what's going on over in Europe, which is just like chaos and a mess at this point. <laughs> so the video I chose to watch is John Green's Crash Course on the War of 1812. The reason I decided to watch this one is because it has the most views out of all of the videos on this on YouTube. And I have seen a couple of John Green's videos in the past on more like world history. I think it was more like the ancient civilizations. And I remember that I enjoyed it and he was a pretty good teacher. Now I am going into this aware that this is an American teaching this. So I don't know if he's going to have any sort of bias at all in this. Hopefully it's a pretty objective viewpoint. Now there are some longer documentaries on YouTube. I see one here that's a couple of hours long that would be interesting to do maybe at another time. All of these subjects that I'm doing these shorter videos on are things that I would like to get more in depth into later on. These videos are just introductions for me. And also I think this is the very first video on my channel that is focused on the United States and on America. And I have said in the past that I would like to do more stuff on the US on my channel just because it is part of history and there are a lot of holes in my knowledge even when it comes to the United States. So anyway, let's go ahead and check out this video. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course US History and today we're going to talk about what America's best at. War! Uh, Mr. Green, the United States has actually only declared war five times in the last 230 years. Oh, me from the past, you sniveling literalist. Well, today we're going to talk about America's first declared war, the War of 1812, so-called because historians are terrible at naming things. I mean, they could have called it the Revolutionary War Part Du, or the Canadian Cataclysm, or the War to facilitate future wars. But no, oh. they just named it after the year it started. I didn't know this was the first declared war of the US. Um, Congress does have to officially declare a war in order for us to be authorized to go to war, but you know, that's really kind of gone by the wayside a lot. I think that's only really happened with like the more major wars, but for like the smaller stuff that we do around the world, Congress doesn't really get involved in that. The, the president just says like, you know, go 
go fight, go do this. Yeah, it's really kind of illegal. According to our constitution, the president should always be going to Congress for war authorizations, and uh, it just doesn't happen like it's supposed to which kind of bums me out. Um, there's a lot of rogue stuff that happens in our country, unfortunately, in our government uh, that I wish didn't happen. Executive orders being another one of those. I know this disappoints the military historians among you, but as usual, we're gonna spend more time talking about the causes and effects of the war than the actual, like, killing parts, because ultimately okay. it's the ambiguity of the War of 1812 that makes it so interesting. The reason most often given for the War of 1812 was the British impressment of American sailors, whereby American sailors would be kidnapped and basically forced into British servitude. This disrupted American shipping. It also seems like a reasonably obvious violation of American sovereignty, but it's a little more complicated than that. First of all, there were many thousands of British sailors working aboard American ships, so many of the sailors that the British captured were in fact British. Which gets to the larger point that citizenship at the time was a pretty slippery concept, especially on the high seas, like papers were often forged and many sailors identified their supposed Americanness through tattoos of like eagles and flags. No and way. there were several reasons why a British sailor might want to become or pretend to be an American, including that the Brits at the time were fighting Napoleon in what historians in their infinite creativity called the Napoleonic Wars. And on that topic, Britain's impressment policy allowed them both to disrupt American shipping to France and to get new British sailors yep. to strengthen their war effort, which was annoying to the Americans on a couple levels, especially the French-loving Republicans, which is a phrase that you don't hear very often anymore. Another reason often given for the war was America's crazy conspiracy Anglophobia. There was even a widespread rumor that British agents were buying up Connecticut. Wait a second, the French loving Republicans. The Republican Party wasn't even established over here until Abraham Lincoln in like the 1860s, maybe late 1850s. So I don't really get that comment about French loving Republicans effort, which was annoying to the Americans on a couple levels, especially the French-loving Republicans, which is a phrase that you don't hear very often anymore. Another reason often given for the war was America's crazy conspiratorial anglophobia. There was even a widespread rumor that British agents were buying up Connecticut sheep in order to sabotage the textile industry, lest you worry that America's fascination with conspiracy theories is new. So those put- Okay, so I have to stop it there for a second. These terms, Anglo, for instance, I- don't really have a very solid understanding of what that is exactly. I see it a lot in the comments on my videos. I've heard it in reference in some things I've read or in other videos that I've done. In my cursory knowledge of it, I associate that with England and maybe like the uh, Catholic background of the Church of England, maybe. I might be way, way off on that, but if you guys can explain to me exactly Anglo, like, what is that? What does that represent? Because apparently he's saying here that the U.S. was kind of anti-Anglo. I'm gonna go back and listen to that again. Anymore. Another reason often given for the war was America's crazy conspiratorial Anglophobia. There was even a widespread rumor that British agents were buying up Connecticut sheep in order to sabotage the textile industry, lest you worry that America's fascination with conspiracy theories is new. So those pushing for war were known as war hawks, and the most famous among them was Kentucky's Henry Clay. They took the impressment of sailors as an affront to American national honor, but they also complained that Britain's actions were an affront to free trade, by which they meant America's ability to trade with Europeans other than Great Britain. And to be fair, the British were trying to regulate American trade. They even passed the Orders in Council, which required American ships to dock in Britain and pay tax before trading with other European nations. Britain. Yeah, I imagine that did not go down well here. Um, okay, so I've learned in the Napoleonic Wars that Britain did continue trade with uh, Russia, for instance. Um, France was trying to cut off their trade with continental Europe, but Britain was still kind of operating behind the scenes a little bit because France just did not have the navy to fully stop them. So Britain kind of ruled the waves, so to speak. And I understand they did not want America trading with continental Europe because of Napoleon's influence there. And apparently we were kind of on good terms with France at this time, which again makes sense because they did help us during the Revolutionary War here. And I also think it was Napoleon that did sell us the Louisiana Purchase. So we had kind of a good relationship 
with France. Well, I don't know if good is the right word, but we had a relationship with France. Britain didn't like that. Tensions between Britain and America were probably still kind of reeling a bit from the Revolutionary War. Okay, so it all kind of fits together. I see how this makes sense now. Ships to dock in Britain and pay tax before trading with other European nations. Britain, we were an independent nation. You can't do that kind of stuff. We have a special relationship. It's not that special. But the problem with saying this caused the war is that the orders had been in effect for five years before the war started, and they were rescinded in 1812 before the U.S. declared war, although admittedly we didn't know about it because it didn't reach us until after we declared there was no Twitter. Another reason for okay, the war well, was canon. Fair enough, though. That that means that it probably did cause the war because things had been rising up to that tension for that five years. We didn't know about the orders being rescinded, so technically it probably was still the cause of the war. At least that's what I got out of that. I, I don't know. Canada. That's because it didn't reach us until after we declared war. There was no Twitter. Another reason for the war was Canada. That's right, Canada. Americans wanted you. And who can blame them with your excellent health care and your hockey and your first-rate national anthem? Stan, this is fun, but enough with the hashtag 1812 problems. According to Virginia Congressman John Rudolph, agrarian cupidity, not maritime rights, urges the war we have heard. What is with him coloring their faces? <laughs> These weird colors. National anthem. Stan, this is fun, but enough with the hashtag 1812 problems. According to Virginia Congressman John Rudolph, agrarian cupidity, Rudolph. not maritime right. Randolph? Wait, is he making a joke, Rudolph, and that's why his face is red, like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer? Well, problems. According to Virginia Congressman John Rudolph, agrarian cupidity, not maritime rights, urges the war. We have heard but one word Canada. Canada. Canada! I'm not here to criticize you, John Randolph, but that's actually three words. Now, some historians disagree with this, but the relentless <laughs> pursuit of new land certainly fits in with the Jeffersonian model of an agrarian republic. And there's another factor that figured into America's decision to go to war, expansion into territory controlled by Native Americans. Oh, it's time for the mystery document? <laughs> The rules here are simple. I try to guess the author of the mystery document. Usually I'm wrong and I get shocked. All right, let's see what we got here. You want, by your distinctions of Indian tribes and allotting to each a particular tract of land, to make them to war with each other. You never see an Indian come and endeavor to make the white people do so. It's Tecumseh, drop the mic! Is something that I would do, except that the mic is actually attached to my shirt, so there's no there's no drama in this. Clearly a Native American criticism of white people, and I happen to know that that particular one comes from Tecumseh, and I don't get shocked today. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Americans were continuing to push westward into territory where Indians were living. I mean, this was a big reason for the Louisiana Purchase, after all. By the beginning of the war, more than do any of you guys get irked by calling them Indians? I prefer the term Native Americans because I think the Indians were kind of a miss nomer because the explorers coming over here were trying to get to India, like the real India. And so they just started calling the natives here Indians. So it, it always kind of like irks me when I hear Native Americans here referred to as Indians because it's it's not even it's not even close to right. The territory where Indians were living. I mean, this was a big reason for the Louisiana Purchase after all. By the beginning of the war, more than 400,000 settlers had moved into territories west of the original 13 colonies and they outnumbered American Indians by a significant margin. Some Native groups responded with a measure of assimilation. Cherokees like John Ross wanted to become more more civilized, that is more white and farmery, and some of them did even adopt such civilized practices as written languages and slavery. The most civilized practice of all. <laughs> uh, people are always like, why aren't you more celebratory of American history? Well, why isn't there more to celebrate? But other Indians wanted to resist. The best known of these were the aforementioned Tecumseh and his brother Tens Stan, can you just put on the screen? <clears throat> Yes, let's just enjoy looking at that. Right, that's just for all you visual learners. So he was also known as the Prophet because of his religious teachings and also because of the pronunciation issues. The Prophet encouraged Indians, especially those living in and around the settlement of Prophetstown, to abandon the ways of the whites, primarily in the form of alcohol and manufactured consumer goods. So stop drinking alcohol and eating refined sugars. This guy sounds like my doctor. Tecumseh was more militant, attempting to revive Neolan's idea of pan-Indianism and actively resisting white settlement. As he put it, sell a country? Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth. 
Did not the Great Spirit make them all for the use of his children? The Americans responded to this reasonable criticism in the traditional manner, with guns. William Henry Harrison destroyed the native settlement at Prophetstown in what would become known as the Battle of Tippecanoe. He would later ride that fame all the way to the presidency in 1840, and then, spoiler alert, he would give the longest inauguration address ever, catch a cold, and die 40 days later. Let that be a lesson to you American politicians. Long speeches? I didn't know that. I knew he became president, but I didn't know he was only in office for 40 days. Catch a cold and die 40 days later. Let that be a lesson to you American politicians. Long speeches? Fatal. So I've just painted a pretty negative picture of the Americans' treatment of the Indians, because it was awful, but I haven't mentioned how this relates to the War of 1812. The Americans were receiving reports that the British were encouraging Tecumseh, which they probably were. And the important thing to remember here is that the War of 1812, like the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, was also a war against Indians. And as in those other two wars, the Indians were the biggest losers. And not in the cool way of the biggest loser, where like, trainer Bob helps you lose weight, but in the really sad way, where your entire civilization gets John C. Calhoun. So the War of 1812 was the first time that the United States declared war on anybody. It was also the smallest margin of a declaration of war vote, 79 to 49 in the House and 19 to 13 in the Senate. Northern states, which relied on trade a lot, didn't want to go to war, while southern and western states, which were more agrarian and wanted expansion to get land for farming and slavery, did. The closeness of the vote reflects a profound ambivalence about the war. As Henry Adams wrote, many nations have gone to war in pure gaiety of the heart, but perhaps the United States were the first to force themselves into a war they dreaded, in the hope that the war itself might create the spirit they lacked. Don't worry, Henry Adams, in the future we're gonna get pretty gaiety of heartish about war. Anyway, as an actual war, the War of 1812 was something of a farce. Let's go to the thought bubble. The U.S. Army numbered 10 to 12,000, and its officers were sunk into either sloth, ignorance, or habits of intemperate drinking. The U.S. Navy had 17 ships. Great Britain had a thousand. Also, America had very little money. 17 ships. Boy, have times changed, that's for sure. Had 17 ships, Great Britain had a thousand. Also, America had very little money. Britain collected 40 times more tax revenue than the U.S. But Britain was busy fighting Napoleon, which is why they didn't really start kicking America's butt until 1814, after Napoleon was defeated. Napoleon's defeat was also the end of the practice of impressment, since Britain didn't need so many sailors anymore. Initially, much of the war consisted of America's attempts to take Canada, which any map will show you went smashingly. Americans were confident that the Canadians would rush to join the U.S. When marching from Detroit, General William Hull informed the Canadians that, quote, you will be emancipated from tyranny and depression and restored to the dignified station of free men. And the Canadians were like, yeah, we're okay, actually. And so the British in Canada, with their Indian allies, went ahead and captured Detroit and then forced Hull's surrender. America that attitude actually prevails even today. There's a, there is a distinct difference between Canadians and Americans. Even though we're very much alike, I mean, I feel like in a lot of ways, Canada is really just an extension of the United States. But at the same time, there are some huge differences, especially in attitudes towards like the British crown and stuff. Americans are staunchly against monarchies, especially back then, I guess when the monarchy might have had a little bit more power than it does today. While Canada is perfectly accepting of it. Uh, I have a very good friend who is Canadian and she has a very just like nonchalant attitude towards, you know, the British influence on Canada still and being part of the Commonwealth, paying homage to the Queen and stuff like that. So uh, I can't pretend to understand exactly how it all works. So forgive me if I get any of this wrong, but, but Americans are like, uh, yeah, no, no thanks. Canada's perfectly happy being part of the Commonwealth. Americans, I think by and large would not want to be part of the Commonwealth at all because we see ourselves as kind of like he said in the beginning, like that independent nation. So what he's saying here, as far as the attitude goes, yeah, America's thought we were going and doing Canada a favor uh, because we had a very different view, I think, than the Canadians did towards England and the UK and the crown and stuff. So, and the Canadians were like, nah, you know, we're good. We'll, we'll just kind of keep things the way they are. We don't mind it, you know? So I think it's pretty funny, like the, the different, um, attitudes and viewpoints 
towards that. America's lack of success in Canada was primarily attributable to terrible strategy. They might have succeeded if they'd taken Montreal, but they didn't want to march through northern New York because it was full of Federalists who were opposed to the war. Instead, they concentrated on the west, that is the area around Detroit, where fighting went back and forth. The British found much more success, even seizing Washington, D.C. and burning the White House. In the course of the battle, British Admiral George Cockburn, overseeing the destruction of a newspaper printing house, told the forces that took the city, be sure that all the seas are destroyed so that the rascals cannot any longer abuse my name. It's hard out there for a cockburn. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Given these problems, it's amazing there were any American successes, but there were. The battleship USS Constitution broke the myth of British naval invincibility when cannonballs bounced off it and earned it the nickname Old Ironsides. Oliver Hazard- Yes, that is something we also learn about here. Old Ironsides, the Constitution, is a very famous name in uh, Navy. I feel like the USS Constitution is kind of like our HMS victory over here. Although probably not nearly as storied, but you know, we only have like a 250 year old history, so. American successes, but there were. The battleship USS Constitution broke the myth of British naval invincibility when cannonballs bounced off it and earned it the nickname Old Ironsides. Oliver Hazard Perry defeated a British fleet in, of all places, Lake Erie. At the Battle of the Thames, William Henry Harrison defeated Tecumseh, and the Battle of Horseshoe Bend showed one of the reasons why Indians were defeated when Andrew Jackson played one group of Creeks against another group of Creeks and Cherokees. 800 Indians were killed in that battle. And speaking of Jackson, and the most notable American victory of the war was the Battle of New Orleans, which catapulted him to prominence. He lost only 71 men while inflicting 2,036 British casualties. Of course, the most memorable thing about the battle was that it took place two weeks after the peace treaty ending the war had been signed, but hey, that's not Jackson's fault. Again, no Twitter. Hashtag 1815 problems. The Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, proved just how necessary the war had been. Not at all. No territory changed hands. When negotiations started in August 1814, the British asked for northern Maine, demilitarization of the Great Lakes, and some territory to create an independent nation for the Indians in the Northwest. But none of that happened. Not because the U.S. was in a particularly good negotiating position, but because it would have been awkward for Great Britain to carve out pieces of the U.S. and then tell Russia and Prussia that they couldn't take pieces of Europe for themselves to celebrate their victory in the Napoleonic Wars. There were no provisions in the treaty about impressment or free trade, and basically the treaty returned to everything to the status quo, so neither the U.S. nor Britain actually won. But the Indians, who suffered significant casualties and gave up even more territory, definitely lost. So with a treaty like that, the war must have had a negligible impact on American history, right? Except no, the War of 1812 confirmed that the U.S. would exist. Britain would never invade America again until 1961. I mean, the U.S. were good customers and Great Britain was happy to let them trade as wait, long wait, as wait, that wait, trade wait, wasn't- Wait, 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 Is he ref- Let me hear that. War of 1812 confirmed that the U.S. would exist. Britain would never invade America again until 1961. Okay. I mean, the U.S. were- <laughs> My first thought when he said that was going back to uh, the Vulcan that I just watched the When Britain Nukes America Twice video a few days ago. And uh, my very first thought was, that was when uh, the war games happened and Britain kind of invaded us and nuked us. But I might have the, the years wrong on that. I forgot exactly what year the war games took place. I thought it was around 1961 and 62 though. Let me, uh, let me double check that. Okay, 1960, 1961. So I was about dead right with that. Yeah, but then he showed a picture of the Beatles, but they didn't really become big here in 1961. Like, I feel like it was 1963 before they really got any prominence over here in the U.S. So that that's weird to me. I, I don't I don't really follow what he's talking about here. That the U.S. would exist. Britain would never invade America again until 1961. I mean, the U.S. were good customers, and Great Britain was happy to let them trade as long as that trade wasn't helping a French dictator. The war launched Andrew Jackson's career and solidified the settlement and conquest of land east of the Mississippi River, and our lack of success in Canada reinforced Canadian nationalism while also ensuring that instead of becoming one great nation, we would forever be Canada's pants. The war also spelled the end of the Federalist Party. Or Canada is America's hat, you know. Just depends on how you look at it. Nation 
we would forever be Canada's pants. The war also spelled the end of the Federalist Party, which tried in 1815 with the Hartford Convention to change the Constitution. In retrospect, the Hartford Convention proposals actually look pretty reasonable. They wanted to eliminate the clause wherein black people were counted as three-fifths of a human and require a two-thirds congressional majority to declare war. But because they had their convention right before Jackson's victory at New Orleans, they only came off looking unpatriotic and out of touch, as the elite so often do. It's hard to argue argue that Americans really won the War of 1812, but we felt like we won, and nothing unleashes national pride like war winning. The nationalistic fervor that emerged in the early 19th century was, like most things, good news for some and bad news for others. But what's important to remember, regardless of whether you're an American, is that after 1812, the United States saw itself not just as an independent nation, but as a big player on the world stage. For better and for worse, that's a gig we've held on to. And no matter how you feel about America's international intervention, you need to remember, it didn't begin in Afghanistan or even Europe. It started with freaking Canada. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Okay, so the War of 1812. There were some things mentioned in there that I do recall from school now that uh, I've heard it again. But like he said, even though there was no real change that came from the war, what it did do is it did solidify America's position on the world stage. It did solidify Canada as its own nation and kind of connected to Great Britain. So I guess at least we got that out of it. To me, it kind of sounded like he was fairly objective in his viewpoint on this and not super biased towards the American point of view, but I don't really know. Like, I'm an American learning about this, so it's really hard for me to kind of gauge that. I'd be interested to hear from some of you who are over in the UK uh, what you think about what you just watched. Though he kept calling them Indians in this video, which I didn't really... I, I didn't like that. I mean, they're not they're not Indians. But anyway, uh, how it refers back to Europe, I kind of mentioned in, in the middle of the video kind of how all that happened. Uh, it looks like the main thing was our trade with Europe. Britain was kind of trying to block that. We were trying to trade with France and maybe some other countries. We did not like Britain telling us what to do, basically is what I gathered from that. And uh, we got a little greedy and tried to take Canada, which did not work out. So anyway, very interesting. This was a very simplistic view looking at the War of 1812. I would be very much interested in watching a longer documentary, maybe learning all of this stuff in a little bit more detail. Oh, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the video, I do have some social media that you can go and check out. On Facebook, I have a Facebook page, but the more active thing is my Facebook group, so you'll probably want to look at that. We have some pretty good discussions that go on there, and you guys can kind of get to know each other a little bit better in the Facebook group. I've got a Discord coming probably in the next few days or the next week or so, so stay tuned for that. And also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. I've got more stuff like this coming your way in the future, so you don't want to miss it. Roger and I certainly appreciate you watching, and we hope that you will join us next time.